guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. Hope you're all having a really good start to your week so far. We woke up to snow. Yay. Yeah, like what, three-ish yeah. inches? And it's wet snow. Like it's already starting to melt, but it was the type Perfect that like- snowball. Yeah, the kids snow. are actually outside playing right now. Um, it's the type that like piles up on your branches. It weighs everything down. Like we're gonna have to remove snow, <laughs> all the evergreens this morning, um, but it's gorgeous. And I'm so happy we got our bulbs in. Yeah, like in the nick of time, yeah, right? Yeah, that was just, the timing was perfect. You guys, today's recap video is sponsored by Hoselink, which I will talk about in just a few minutes. But for now, let's just jump right into the first video of last week, which was Beautiful Garden Inspiration. So that was a viewer submission video you guys sent in submissions. We have a lot of submissions, so... There are, we could, we could <clears throat> probably do like, at this one point... One a week for... How many well, years? You know what? We'll probably have enough to where, and I'm sure more will submit, but um, we'll have enough to get us to May probably. And then mm -hmm. we'll probably take a break from doing it because mm -hmm. it's busy. Yeah, that time I, of year I, for us. <laughs> I, I wager it'll stop before then and we'll pick back up when it, maybe the dog yeah. days in July or something yeah. when it's super this hot. This is the best time of year to be doing things like that though, mm -hmm. to be looking for inspiration. Yeah. And you guys delivered. I mean, just that first group of gardens from all over the world. I mean, we had South Africa, Italy. I'm trying to remember all the, was there one from Sweden? Lots, yeah, from, Poland. lots from Canada. That Hartley in Poland? Yeah. No, no. Was that Hartley in the UK? No. Oh. Well, there was the one, was there David two? Sharp. There was another one. I think it was in Poland. Oh. Yeah, anyway, there's just a very vast array of styles and it's setups. It's hilarious, though, going through the photos because some people, like, accidentally send, like, photos of recipes or, a like... A spreadsheet they're working yeah, on. Spread, <laughs> like, there's just a lot of accidental things that get sent over. Like, yeah. All right, well, we'll skip Maybe we over can learn one. something yeah. here. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm actually surprised, Aaron, you were able to get so many questions. Typically on submission videos, we don't... Yeah, there seem to be of... some good ones. Yeah, okay. So Harley said, how do you stop weeds in your mulch? Help. We have, well, a pretty thick layer of mulch, one, which does help. We also have Paul and Bethany helping us outside. <laughs> which, get a Paul I mean, and Bethany. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. I mean, we don't do this all by ourselves. We couldn't and put out as many videos as we do um, and do as many projects as we do without having really good help. And we've got such an amazing team of people. It's amazing how like your team makes, makes yeah. it or breaks it. it. Really, it can either be a struggle or it can be amazing and it is amazing. It was a ghost. Packet, <laughs> seed packets falling on my left here. In, in our last garden though, before we had help, it seemed like you kind of like just chunked it up and would do, Zoned it. you know, a zone system and do yeah. like what, five, 10 minutes a day. Yeah, and that's how we did our less. property before I had help here because I did it by myself for mm -hmm. the first year or two. Yeah first two years we didn't have the south garden at that point it was just you know it was still almost two, two acres, acres of gardens yeah. though that's a lot um, and i was still working at the garden center so what i did is I, I chunked it up into five sections and did one section every day and i've done videos maybe we can link one about how i zone the garden um, and then like bigger garden chores uh you know fertilizing day was a specific day uh, insect preventative or treatment day was a certain day uh, and so it all to keep it organized like if you put your eyeballs on every spot in your garden at least once a week, it hardly becomes any maintenance at all, even if it's a bigger space, mm -hmm. because nothing is ever allowed to get completely out of control because yeah. you've got, you know, you're consistent about it. Um, we don't have to zone it anymore because Paul and Bethany are just really good at what they do. I don't even ask about it. It's just like... It gets done. They're just like this magical pair of people out there that... I wonder if uh, the question that they asked, if they're actually wondering like, do we use a practically, preen or yeah, preventative? How do you do we it? do not. Hand pull. We hand pull. Well, I usually hand pull. I think Paul and Bethany prefer the hula hoe, mm -hmm. uh, which I can't blame them. Like you can weed standing up. Um, so I think it's just preference, but we don't use, we do use spray in our driveway, which we've done a video about. So maybe we can link that one mm -hmm. as well. We're gonna have to remember all these uh, because we've got a lot of gravel driveway. My seed packets are just, I have, a, I have a stack of poppy seed packets sitting here that we did in winter sowing that I haven't updated my inventory yet. And yeah, so I have them just sitting here in like a willy nilly pile and like every once in a while a packet just falls on the floor. Distracting. Uh, Molly said, could you make these wonderful videos 15 to 20 minutes long, the same quantity just broken into snippets? That would be so hard. I mean, you could just stop watching after 10 to 15 pause and then maybe resume the next part later. 
I really just, I want to give every garden its proper, like its proper due. Mm -hmm. Is that the right? I want to be able to spend enough time to really look at the pictures. And, you know, you've mentioned to me before, maybe you could just like, you know, kind of go through it a little faster. Oh, I'm looking at the quantity that we have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're seeing how many submissions and I don't even know exactly how many submissions. I just know we've got a lot. Um, so I just, I don't know. And I want it to be natural too. You know, sometimes they're just quicker because we're just looking at one pot or a window box which is equally as great, but sometimes, you know, somebody will send in 15 pictures, but they're all awesome. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure to look at them all. So I don't know what to tell you. It kind of just. It is. sort of just is what it ends up being. We, we really don't spend a lot of time trying to make, make videos a specific length. Right. They, you know, when we first started making videos, remember like, what do you think? Three minutes was maybe like the average yeah. length of video. Right. Boy, has that changed. Yeah. Yes, it has. Melissa said, so many beautiful hosta gardens. How does everyone keep them free from insect damage? My hostas get eaten to pieces every su uh, summer, even with using slug and snail bait. There are some really good slug and snail baits. Um, the bug and slug killer is a really good one that I've used. We don't have a huge issue here, though. Is there anything you can release in your garden? That, that eats them? Yeah, we'll eat them. Ducks. Really? <laughs> I, I don't know. Don't ducks eat slugs? That seems like... or something they would do but they'd probably damage your plants too yeah i love ducks i would love to have ducks one day yeah i keep thinking like i wonder if i could add them into the orchard somehow like how it's the water the, the water yeah. is the issue like figuring out a water source i had ducks growing up and i had a big stock tank water mm -hmm. that i kept for their baths but then i had to tip the whole thing over and like, to clear it out and mm -hmm. clean it and it was such a pain anyway that was a side note caroline said are there any hostas that are deer resistant I don't. I don't think so. I mean, maybe some of the thicker leaf. I I don't. Even I've then. heard from people that have deer, like Billy. there's there's nothing. Sure. There's nothing that's deer resistant. If they're if a, if they want it bad enough. Yeah. S Dragonfly said, "Have you done any knitting this winter season?" No, but I keep thinking about it. I did go through my stash, and I do have a, have a stash. I have a fabric stash, and a yarn stash, and a plant stash, <laughs> seed I stash. Think you're a couple years away from knitting. I, I with maybe. Samantha. Cause she's pretty, maybe a year. I keep yeah, thinking that about puzzles too. I love to put together puzzles yeah. in the winter time. I love just to have one going and you just sit down every once in a while with your coffee and work on it. It's such a, like a mindless thing, and I I just enjoy that. But I can't do that yet. Right. Uh, you know, Samantha just turned two this yesterday, mm -hmm. and um, she's still wants to get into everything. Well, the thing is, that Benjamin, I could have done it with Benjamin mm -hmm. because he was. Like he wanted to be involved, but in a very like respectful and way. Respectful way. <laughs> Samantha's just like, I want to get in there yeah. and tear it up. Like yeah. she just wants to so badly be involved, like really involved in what you're doing, which is awesome. And I want to be able to like, encourage encourage it. that. But you got to be kind of careful because I don't want to put things out that's going to end up frustrating me mm. and then you know act frustrated at her. I don't want to do that. So maybe next winter on the puzzle thing and the knitting yeah. thing. Uh, Lion Hawaii said, could you do photos covering infrastructure as a main focus? We just bought a new house that has two foot tall box in the yard, about 20 feet from the porch. The house sits above the cul-de-sac and the electric box is just about car level. We can't plant in front of it, but we can work around the back of it. So one wouldn't see it so much from the house. Any ideas? That's a good idea. Like mm -hmm. doing one on how you, people have masked yeah. You know, infrastructure, we all have infrastructure. All of us do. You can't get away from it, but there are some brilliant ideas out there. Well, okay. So working at a cable company for mm -hmm. 10 years, there are like, if it's a cable or a phone box, mm -hmm. those can be covered. Like there are actual like rock looking boxes mm -hmm. and there's, there's covers. There's just faux rocks that you can put over the top. Mm -hmm. That's an option. The other thing is you can do like picket fences and stuff like that, where that can be easily, like if you drive a couple rods in the ground mm -hmm. and then have something that you can slip over those rods. We had that around our AC unit up front before we got rid of, yeah. you know, moved it to the side right. of the house. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing totally works because if anybody needs to get there and work, they can just like slip the thing up, move mm -hmm. it to the side. Right. So as long as it's not permanent where they couldn't move it out of the way, mm -hmm. there's a lot of solutions. Yeah. But it's, it is a good idea to go over that at some point. Yeah. Chicken House said, when will you be installing water, the waterfall that Greg installed? Do you have a plan for him to build a pond? Yes. Yes. And yes. So I think this next summer, fall, sometime this season, we'll have Greg back out here. We talk with him from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think it'll be really fun to have at least the Pondless Waterfall put back in. I, I know I, 
I know where I think I want to have it and it's going to work out perfectly. It's going to be out in the South garden. We do have a little structure I want to put in out there though first, because it, it's, I kind of want it to be near that. Um, but it's in the works. I don't know if we're actually going to, I mean, if you want to put that specific one in, we certainly could, but I kind of haven't like, I was thinking we could do a bigger one. Well, I think we can do both. Oh, well, yeah. there you go. <laughs> because that one's the perfect size. Yeah. That it was a kit, an Aquascape kit. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember all the de exact details right off the top of my head, but um, the hole that you dig for the reservoir was about four by four and maybe, I don't know, two feet deep, mm -hmm. maybe a little deeper than that. Um, and then, you know, you kind of like contour the land up from it and put those boulders and stuff in. Uh, and it's just the perfect size to tuck in, mm -hmm. which is kind of what I need in the spot out that I'm thinking of. But back here, like view from the Hartley, it might be really pretty to have a pond in the back garden. Yeah. Like a, not a huge pond, but something that's decent enough to maybe put fish in mm -hmm. possibly. We'll see. Uh, Susan said, you mentioned your land is so flat. Have you thought of building some hills or terrace layers with big rocks and mounded dirt? We thought about it in the very beginning when we were starting to think through ideas and you know, I, I'm torn on that whole subject because I don't like making land look like it's man-made, you know? Mm -hmm. I like working with the curvature that your land is. I think, uh, I mean, we could have added a little berming. A little berm goes a long way though. When mm -hmm. you've got a flat piece of property, it just automatically starts to look like, I don't know. Yeah, I <sighs> agree with you. I think that, um, you know, you have to bring in a lot of dirt to make it not just look like a little, you know, I. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. It would be, it could be done. And I think once you get your plants in and stuff, mm -hmm. you could really make it look nice, even if, and make it even look more natural, even if your land is flat to start with. Um, but I don't know, it's just a little bit out of my wheelhouse. Yeah. I think maybe, maybe if I had somebody who's really good at it, like Jack, Jack would be great, you sure. know, at adding something like that in, he'd make it look amazing. All right, guys, so let's talk about hose link retractable hoses. We've talked about these several, several times, and we have a lot of them now they are a 82 well they've got two sizes a 50 foot and an 82 foot retractable hose that goes into this plastic shroud so you pull it out and then when you're done you know you do your thing you're done using it you tug on it a little bit and it wheels itself back in I mean, it's been such a it's game. amazing it's amazing it's been a game changer i was a little bit reluctant in the very beginning because it retracts into a plastic shroud mm -hmm. and i just didn't know how that would look in the garden but they now have a charcoal color which is awesome they just to kind of disappear and i honestly don't even think it would matter the color of them anymore because they have been so so useful in our garden do you know how many hose links we have 15, <laughs> 15 more or less than 15 more than 15. we have a lot of them now. it's one of the best investments we have put into our garden yeah and, and i i want to say too that we have purchased like we've actually spent the money on the vast majority of them mm -hmm. like over 90 percent of them yeah they also, so you might wonder like, okay, so if I install one of them, you can uh, do it on the side of a building. We have one on the side of our barn. You can put them on the top of a post or you can put them on a metal pipe mm -hmm. coming out of the ground. Um, you just lift them up and they're not like, they're light enough for me to hang, hang on to. You lift them up and you drain them, put them here in the barn for the winter time. So it's really easy to pick them up and store them way easier than lugging your big wheel of hose around. And I know tons of you guys have invested in hose links too and i get messages all the time saying you know like game thank changer you for, thank yeah, you yeah telling me to get one of these yeah so you guys hose link has an offer of ten dollars off of an order of a hundred dollars it is code garden 2023 yes we'll put all the information in the description below thank you hose link for sponsoring this video next video is how i grow ranunculus and Schedule of planting dates. I can't remember how we title all of these things. Uh, I wanted to get some ranunculus in the pre-sprout stage so that I could get them potted up and hopefully grown on to a closer to bloom stage so I can use them in early spring containers. I usually buy ranunculus down at the garden center when it's really early and I thought, well, I've got corms here. If I start them early enough, you know, if you've got a warm spot, like the greenhouse is what we're using. Um, if you've got a warm so spot with lots of light, you can start really early. But I also talked about um, succession planting, how I did it last year, where I kind of did the same thing, but a little bit later, where I started half of our ranunculus early, got them going in the greenhouse, potted them up. And then uh, I would think it was like late March. I took, and then I had a second batch. The second batch I just had in the pre-sprout, but no upward, no green growth yet. I took both batches out into the flower garden on the same day, planted them. So half of them had green growth on the top of the soil and half of them were just the corms underneath the ground. So I had like a good solid, I would say anywhere between 
10, 12 weeks of bloom hmm. out of those ranunculus because I had them in different growing stages. So now I'm hoping to have the three growing stages. Once ranunculus start blooming, they go for about four to six weeks or so. Uh, and they're a strong, cool season annual. Here they do so well for us. Uh, and in this process, I could have skipped the pre-sprout Stay, uh, stage or uh, process. I could have just soaked the corms and potted them straight into containers in the greenhouse. But one of the nice thing about, things about pre-sprouting is you can check viability of your corms. It's a really quick way just to line them up in a tray and then you can unearth them, see which ones have sprouted and which ones haven't. You can pitch the ones that haven't. You can try to give them some time. Sometimes they'll, they'll come around, but it's a really good way to check viability. So I just thought that that would be interesting then to show you too what the roots look like. They already have roots on them. It's only been like under a week. Wow. I pulled one out yesterday. It's already got white roots coming out. Oh, this is promising. Yay. Um, Asylum Lane said, what happens if you mistakenly planted them dry? <laughs> Asking for a friend. I did talk about how no matter what planting process you go through, because you can just soak them and plant them straight out in the ground if the weather is good enough. Um, but pre-soaking is pretty important because it's what like readies your corms for growing. But... Things are resilient. Things happen in nature without us intervening. You might be okay. I mean, just make sure that they're sufficiently watered, but not too much <laughs> so that they don't rot. Uh, just see what happens. You might be surprised. Amanda said, thanks for the video. How do you water after pre-sprouting? I kind of wish I would have talked about this in the video because I lined those corms up in watertight trays. And really the whole goal of the pre-sprout process is just to keep them mildly damp, like not even close to wet. Um, so I might water them, well, the first time I had it, the soil in there was already pre-moistened. And so I didn't have to water them that day. I've watered, I've sprinkled a tiny little bit of water on them day before yesterday. And I may have to do that one more time, just a tiniest bit. And then once I pot them up into containers, they'll be draining. And then I just make sure that they stay, uh, I don't know, I let the top kind of look dry before I water them again. And that will be different based on where you have them, how much heat they're getting and airflow and all of that. Barb said, I've been looking for those crates. Could you provide some info on where to get them? The big black crate. I showed one of those, didn't I? Those are what our bulbs come in from color blends. So we just or order some bulbs from color blends. Well, <laughs> yeah. You gotta, you gotta order some good amount to get the crates. I think, um, I don't know how many they usually put in there. I guess it depends on the size of the bulb, but sure. that's where we've got all of our black crates. I'm not sure if those exist. I mean, I'm sure other people use those for things. And can you buy them? I'm sure yeah, I'm you, sure you can go to a hardware store. Like, you know, Home Depot would have. They have more have like those. milk crate looking things, which yeah. would be nice too, except I think the holes are a little bigger. Hmm. That's the beauty of these crates is that the, the holes are, you know, pretty close together. Sure. I will, maybe we can link color blends down below. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only way I know. I mean, you might be able to Google you know, black plastic crates, and you might be able to find something similar. Occupied Mum said, Ranunculus are beautiful flowers, but am I the only one who gets the heebie-jeebies from the corms? <laughs> they give me giant spider vibes or octopus vibes. They look like, just think of them as like mini, well, dahlia clumps don't look any better. They just look like giant ones. <laughs> yeah. They look like miniature dahlia tuber clumps. They are a little creepy looking. It's amazing that something so beautiful can come from something that looks like a gnarled up dead yeah. spider. Yeah. E equals MC2 said, squared, MC squared. Where did you get all your wooden tables with the tires? I've been searching for a couple of those. Well, we built them all between mm -hmm. you and me and Paul. Mm -hmm. And did Eddie build some yeah, too? Yeah, I think Eddie built one or two. Yeah. We've built them here. We did a video about it. We put one, to, like built one in a video. Yeah. Uh, and then I think I'm standing on top of it as the thumbnail yeah. to show how strong they are. Right. <laughs> SE said, what if I don't have a fancy greenhouse? Where do I leave the corms? <laughs> Why do you laugh? Can you you send, send some sass? Yeah, in that? a little bit of sass, I think, in that comment. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I used to put them in our basement for pre-sprouting because you want a, want temperatures between 40 and 60. And our basement, now it feels like ever since we had a new heat system put in, it stays a little bit more warm down mm -hmm. there. Uh, but it used to stay fairly cool. And it is cooler than our house. It still worked down there. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're doing it early earlier than you can plant them outside, you would make, want to make sure you have a nice bright spot in your house. You could put them in a south, south facing window would be the perfect thing. If you have a little table there and you can line them up, um, just make sure to rotate them. Or if you grow lights uh, somewhere, you could do that as well. Or you could just soak the corms, pre-sprout them and toss them straight out in the garden. Just wait later into the season. 
or it's warm enough. You just don't want those corms to be subjected to temperatures lower than 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when they start to rot. Julie said, can you share where you order them from? I've gotten them from Johnny's. I've got them from uh, Florette, who was the first. Florette actually, actually sent me out a bunch of them. Um, and that was kind of my first foray into ranunculus. Um, where else have I ordered them from? That might be it. Did I get some from, maybe from Eden Brothers? Maybe I got a few. Next video was winter sowing poppies and artichokes. Now I actually, I think, and I think I even mentioned that I wasn't gonna do any winter sowing this year and I never intended on it. And then I started thinking about poppy seeds and how, because I went through my seed inventory and have so many gorgeous varieties of poppies, I tried the whole, you know, scatter them on top of the snow and let the spring moisture bring them up, but you gotta have spring moisture to make that yeah, happen. Right. And the only ones that came up were the ones that happened to fall right next to an emitter on our drip line. Like they got just enough moisture, like we had the water on early enough to bring them up. Uh, and the problem, like I could still do that. I could still scatter them if I knew where our drip lines all were. Mm. Um, because if I just scatter them willy nilly, then I'm gonna have so much seed loss because so many of them are gonna fall in between drip lines and not get quite enough coverage to come up. I'd get some, but not, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had actually done the winter sowing method with poppies. It was either last year or the year before that and planted them around the chicken coop. They did so well and poppies, and it'll tell you on every seed packet, they do not wanna be transplanted. They'll resent you for it, you know, direct seed them out in the garden. I didn't have any problem with it, so I was encouraged by that, that I had had experience and had it work. So I just decided, you know what, I've got a little collection of plastic jugs, we may as well put our poppies in them, and a few artichokes. And the reason I did the artichokes as a winter sowing project is because they are aphid magnets in the seedling stage, well, anytime. But in seedling stage here, like I'll have clean seedlings, clean, no, no insects, and then the artichokes somehow, like the aphids, hmm. where did they come from? Yeah. It's like they're part of the seed of the artichoke. Yeah. <laughs> they are like born with the plant and they just are magnets for it. And I don't really want that around the rest of my seedlings. So anyway, um, so I just went through the whole process of winter sowing and it really is a super easy thing to do. Low maintenance, um, don't need any special equipment. It's low commitment in terms of budget and space and all of that. So if you're just getting started with seed starting, is this a, I think a really good method. Don't you think like, yeah. Yeah, I think it's like the most accessible way to start. Yeah. Carol said, at what point do you cut or take the lids off the poppies? When it starts to get pretty darn warm in the spring, poppies are pretty tough. And normally, most of the things you're doing in winter sowing are more cold tolerant things anyway. Um, you know, hardier perennials, cool season annuals. Uh, some people will do tomatoes and peppers and all kinds of things, but you know, you want to be more mindful about temperatures for those heat lovers. But in my case, it's usually cold tolerant stuff and I can probably pop the lids off sometime in April, I would imagine. Jenny said, is it possible to not put holes in the bottom and leave the lid on? I wouldn't do that. I think you need airflow. Drainage is essential and having that lid open is essential. I mean, you could try it. Let us know how it goes. It's you know worth a shot if you wanna like leave one all closed up and see what happens. Firefly said, can you please explain what the difference is if there are any between poppies and peonies? So it's very confusing. I mean, it's not. A poppy is a poppy and a peony is a peony. But when you have, hold on, let me find one. When you have a poppy called purple peony, that's the variety, it's like a peony shaped bloom mm. of a poppy. So I think I had scarlet, scarlet peony, purple peony. So I planted these and I did notice a couple of comments like, you labeled that wrong, you put peony and you're planting poppies. Um, so so anyway. poppies are annual. No, well they're, these will self seed them, themselves. Mm. And a lot of poppies are perennial too. Mm. Yeah, mine, I have those, um, I can't even remember the, the big pink ones and then the white ones with the black throat that come mm -hmm. back every single year. So it, it, they produce tons and tons and tons of seed. Hmm. Like one seed head. If you wanna get in the business of like selling things, grow dahlias, cause the tubers just like boom. Or grow poppies, because you get thousands and thousands of seed from one flower, sure. one spent, yeah, one seed head. And it's interesting because like I'll have some, let's see, how many were in here? Let's see. Well, the, these had a lot, okay. There are some of these that didn't have very many. Or maybe it just didn't seem like 200 seeds, which is nothing in poppy terms, because they're so tiny. 25 seeds. Wow. Yeah, so I don't know what the deal is with that one, and it was the same price, but like 600 seeds, 25 seeds. 
So like get the, the varieties that are more sought after or more rare or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start growing those. That's what we need to do, Aaron. Side hustle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shelly said, I maybe missed it, but what kind of light do you put the jugs in? Should it be a fairly sunny location? I'm in Kansas and can have fairly warm days in the winter like the past several that were in the 50s. Um, yes, you want to do, you do want to put them in a sunny position and I should have said that day. See, I forget so many details that are important, but yeah, most seeds, they need bright light. So I have them on the south side of the fence back here behind our barn where our barn won't actually shade it. It's kind of in this weird, like, it's like the, like a strip of light. Yeah. Yeah. So they will be really great where they are. Um, I think even better than they were in the the position I put them last year. Life on Mockingbird Hill said, genuine question, why can you not just leave the lights in the tree and just uh, not turn them on? Oh yeah, because you guys got the the lift a little bit stuck in the back garden. Yes. Um, one could. I think it looks messy. It does. To leave lights out. Yeah. All of our lights are down, everything. Yeah. Yeah, they work fast. Uh, Gail said, this intrigues me. I'm in Alberta, Canada, zone three. I have a few questions. At what temperature do you have to protect these or bring them in? You do not. You can let them freeze like a solid block. The whole point is giving these seeds, a lot of these like hardier perennials and things, they need a cold period, like a cold freezing period in order to germinate. Um, so you just leave them alone and then they'll thaw on more of a natural cycle, but they're a little bit warmer than outside because of their dome. Uh, so they will be a little bit ahead of the game versus what you would have outside just exposed. Uh, but that's the whole goal. I mean, you give them that, the, what you've got going outside weather wise, and you're going to have much stronger seedlings, no hardening off period. Yeah. Uh, do you set the containers out where they will get full sun? Yes. Or at least, you know, six to eight hours of sun. Would this method work for cool vegetables such as broccoli and peas? Yes, it would. Mini Verma said, can you winter sow in opaque milk containers from Costco or does it have to be transparent kind from the grocery store? Opaque. It can't be opaque, like completely opaque. Opaque is opaque, right? There's not like a, a great well, the, gradient. Like, is there gra yeah, I don't know. I think of opaque as being somewhere on the scale, I guess. Opaque is like solid, right? Is it? I don't know. Anyway, um, you want to make sure it's either like that. Because I planted some of those milky mm -hmm. uh, like water jugs of what we had. Um, it, it's, they still allow a lot of light in. And I feel like it's almost a little bit more of a filtered light situation. Mm -hmm. um, or you do clear plastic. But nothing that won't allow light in. They have to have light. Uh, Mary said, can you use this method for bulbs if you didn't get them in the ground before freezing? You can or you can just pop them in pots you know, outside. Last video was planting bulbs and harvesting carrots in January. So, so happy about that day. I mean, <laughs> you could feel the energy. You know, when you feel like that first day where you feel oh, spring is coming, right. it's warm, the birds are out. You can be outside doing like doing actual projects. Right. And like I could see neighbors, I could hear neighbor kids out playing. It's such a happy sound. And I could hear like work going on. Our neighbors that actually sold us the South Garden, they popped in and they were on their way to do a hike, but they just wanted to come and chat for a little bit. And uh, it was just like such, it was such a nice day. Um, and we'd had a week of temperatures that I don't think had dipped below freezing. So mm -hmm. the ground was workable to plant all the rest of the bulbs. Uh, we just we just ran out of time in the fall. We had so many things to do and so many bulbs to put in the ground. And typically, I wouldn't have let the bulbs go to waste. I was going to plant them at least in containers, but they were more types that are species. Like they're like the little woodland scillas, um, the species tulips that are a lot shorter, not as showy. Um, so a little bit like less grand in containers. And so I was kind of like, oh, I really want to just get these in the ground somewhere where they can shine and do their thing and I don't have to spend time putting them in containers. So it worked out great. Mary said, what happened to the side of your face? Your smooth, beautiful face. <laughs> I had a big dirt smear on my face <laughs> at the end. Yeah. I wish I would know these things before I put the camera in front of my face. I actually had a moment in there. And I forgot to tell you where, um, usually I have a camera that um, shows a little tiny screen of my face so I can make sure I'm like at, at least looking at the right spot in the camera but it was dark. Like I could oh. not get it to turn on. I actually turned the camera on and off several times trying to, to get that to work. So I was hoping it was when I was walking toward the carrots, I had no idea if I was even pointing it at my face. Hoping for the best. I was hoping for the best. I'm like, well, I'm kind of at the end of my project here. I don't know, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But yeah, so I couldn't see that I had a big dirt smear on my face. Okay. Kat from Illinois said, just a question. How do you know where the other bulbs are when you go into beds that have been planted? I have no idea. <laughs> Sometimes I run into the bulbs. I ran into one bulb. I didn't 
uh, wreck it, I just replanted it. Most of the time with the augers, I just pop stuff out of the soil. Uh, rarely do I like plow through bulbs and wreck them. I mean, occasionally, but it's so few that I just don't even, I kind of have an idea. Like I knew there's Menton tulips out there where they're at. Do you ever look at photos to kind of judge distances or? Nope. I just know like, okay, I've got pink here, so I don't want to put the orange tulips over here because right. that might be a little, you know, um, and then heights and all of that. I just try to make sure I know the general idea of color is main, the main thing. Martha said, do you dig the bulbs up after they finish their show in spring or do they come back the following year? Most of the bulbs we put in the ground in the fall come back from year to year. Tulips aren't as good. I mean, they start to fill, fizzle out. Some don't, like the Darwin series, don't uh, fizzle as fast as species tulips don't fizzle. Um, but there are some that do narcissus daffodils. They are super good at naturalizing, so they'll spread and clump out and you'll have them forever and ever. Valerie said, I love how Russell follows you around. Does he ever ride in the gator with you? No, he jumps out immediately. Cheddar will occasionally ride on the gator with me, but I don't think he loves it. He's kind of just like, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm committed now, yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, Russell jumps off. Annette said, will you be showing how you late winter clean up of the plants in the South Garden? Yes, we will bring you along when we do some clean out out there. Anne said, how about an update on your evergreen trees? Did they all survive? So far, so good. Yeah. They all look really great. There's one branch in that front blue spruce, but it was like that's from the moment it was installed. I'm not sure why we haven't pruned it out. Yeah, we keep like, I don't know. It's just one of those things we never do. No. We just need to take all the pair of loppers out there and get it. It's just like one branch we need yeah. to take out. Yep. We have short legs said, yay to the mom and dad who allow and even encourages gardening to be done in bunny slippers. That is wonderful and sometimes challenging because of the cleanup time involved that Samantha was allowed to dig in and help her mama out. Question, did your mom and dad allow you and your siblings to jump in with an activity when the excitement hit you despite perhaps not wearing the appropriate equipment? And if so, would you attribute that, attribute, mm -hmm. <laughs> my goodness, <laughs> attribute that to you excelling and in each of your present passions? Love this example, Laura. I don't think any uh, emphasis was put on proper equipment in my lifetime. Really? Mm -mm, nope. You just do what you do, you know? I didn't even think about, I actually, well, I did think about her slippers when I ordered them. I'm like, good, they have a, like a little plasticky bottom because mm -hmm. I wear my slippers outside all the time. Yeah. You know, so I wanted her to be able to go in and out and I'm not fussy about shoes in the house. I know a lot of people are, you do you. Um, I am fussy about coasters. Yeah. I <laughs> like coasters. But, but not, not super not fussy. Not super fussy. It's only on the nice furniture, which we don't have a ton of. We've got like the new table. Is, mm -hmm. We just got a new table this last week that I've wanted for like five years. Finally decided to get it. Um, I waited till after Christmas sales. <laughs> uh, and anyway, on stuff like that, which we have very few pieces of, I like coasters to be used because I want to, you know, keep them nice. I suppose the same thing can be said of floors because it would be nice, nicer. All of our stuff would be cleaner and nicer yeah. if we didn't wear shoes around, but it's just not practical for how we live. Um, also with our house, you know, the, the, we have carpet in the great room, just one room downstairs, like the main room that we live in. Yeah. And the kids' bedrooms. But it's really it. old. Yeah, it and needs to be replaced really bad. so bad. But we're kind of at that stage with a two-year-old where it's like, should we just wait a, you know, a couple of years? Because we all or two? eat in there too. Like we're not just strict at the table eaters either. We do dinner. Like we all sit down to dinner together mm -hmm. um, and we do that. But like snacks and stuff, like I want to be able to sit next to Benjamin in the evening and we'll have yeah. popcorn, you know, together. And But I think um, that also kind of just encourages you not to be super fussy about it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Which is... Uh, one of the nice things about not having nice things uh, is that, I don't know. Oh, well, and I wouldn't say we don't have nice things. It looks like fairly put together. <laughs> yeah. But like our coffee table in our great room was $50 on right. a scratch and dent sale, you know, like, and that you can That's put your what feet I mean, on. Though. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, you put your foot on the coffee table and like, we, I wouldn't even dream of being like, oh, don't put your feet on the right. coffee table. You well, know, I mean, we spent it's like, $50 on that. How many years ago? Yeah. 10 plus right. we've had that coffee table. More than that. 15 probably. Well, we've been married for well, 16 and a half years, yeah. just about. And we got it in a townhouse. Yeah, maybe. Maybe yeah. like 13, 14 years ago. Sure. Yeah. That's a good coffee table, yeah, man. Yeah, we got our money's worth out of that we one. We did. And the ding that it had, I just used permanent marker. On. Yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll touch it up a little bit. Anyway, yeah, I, growing up, um, we were in and out bare feet. I mean, I lived bare feet. I walked across, ran across gravel bare feet. Um, and I was a feral child. I was. Yeah. 
there's something interesting about your family. Like you guys just wail into things. Like you were saying, you know, proper attire was never a, a thing, but like also proper equipment was never really a thing either. Like occasionally, sometimes, you know, your mom would have like her Falcos that she liked or, mm-hmm. or things like that. But a lot of times it seems like your parents would do things with like not the proper th- equipment for like 10 years and I'm like, you know, you can, you can automate that. <laughs> you could, uh, you could have like an automatic sprinkler go off. Oh. Like, well, how long did it take your parents to get automatic sprinklers? 20 years. Like they lugged hoses around their yard and in a climate like ours, I don't know if people like fully grasp mm-hmm. the gravity of that, you know? Cause like if you're in the Pacific Northwest, it's like, oh, that's, you know, whatever. Or even the Midwest. Like, yeah, you just water it in the summertime. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Here, you're like watering it all the time. Yeah. You're moving sprinklers every day. We talk about like, what could we accomplish if we move somewhere that actually rained? And we didn't have that struggle. I know there's other struggles because where yeah. it rains, there's That's more humidity. That's what would happen is we would, we'd hit we'd other have powdery struggles. mildew yeah. and we'd have, you know, slugs. And all of a sudden, you'd feel like a beginner gardener again. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yep. Learn to appreciate what you have. Yeah. I don't know how that devolved into that, yeah. but anyway. I feel like I had an idyllic, idyllic childhood. Idyllic, idyllic yeah, sure. childhood. Mm-hmm. I would, looking back, yeah. even when I was in it, I kind of knew it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I well, was really thankful for my childhood. I mean, I had some year, middle school and beginning of high school years where you, I wasn't the best child. You but. grew up to parents that cared. Yeah. That's a big deal. It is a big deal. And you did as well. We were yeah. very lucky. Last comment. I actually thought about addressing this in the video, and I thought, nope, I'm not going to bring any attention. Laura in white tennies? What would her (laughs) vans think? Okay, every time I wear a different pair of shoes, people think I'm pregnant. Yeah. We get comments like that, and I'm not pregnant. Um, And don't ask. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just, it's weird. It's, and I know, like, you get so used to seeing one thing for years, but I think I either got, I either stepped on something weird on my left foot, my heels, just like killing me. I either stepped on something and I didn't realize it, or I got a hold of a bad pair of vans. Because mm. I recently did get a new pair, and I usually get them made custom because I like certain colors, certain places, and it's no more money to get them made custom. It just takes longer. But I ordered these off of Amazon. Huh. Maybe and, they're knockoffs. Uh, you know, who knows, but I just stopped wearing them and I thought, well, I've got, I've got, I used to wear like black Nikes all the time. Mm -hmm. These are like white gray Adidas and they're super comfortable. Um, and I ordered, just ordered a new pair of Nikes because I noticed like all my older shoes, I just haven't worn them for so long and they're kind of like, they're not in great shape. Mm. So I need to get some shoes that are in good shape and make sure I keep that in the forefront because when you have foot pain, you just don't realize it until you have it. Yeah. And then you're thinking, nope, I got to take better care of my feet. I mean, that's a huge part of what we're doing out there. But yeah, I actually thought about it at the very beginning. Like, yes, I'm wearing different shoes. No, I'm not pregnant. Everything's fine. My yeah. life is okay. You know? Yeah. Just funny. have a little bit of foot pain. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys, that is it for today's video. We were short one because we did take another day off this week for Samantha's birthday. We had a great time with the kids. It's It's interesting having birthdays six days apart from one another. Um, Yeah. And right after Christmas, it feels like a lot all at the same time. Uh, Fortunately for, you know, Samantha is only two, so she doesn't really, she got excited. We got her a few little like little calico critters. She has a little house that she puts them in uh, and like a couple new things of (laughs) Play-Doh. She was thrilled. Um, So she's not at an age where we have any kind of standard. I'm weird about standards on birthdays anyway. I don't, I see all of those very highly orchestrated birthdays for these little kids with big balloon arches and like like so like a cake that's super like expensive nice. yeah. yeah like how do you how do you go well, through life like that like because as a kid you kind of like well I just remember my birthdays and they were always similar yeah. and you know what it's going to be you get excited for that but like setting the standard so high we Ooh. had big birthdays on big years five, my mom would, yeah it was like yeah. 5 10 maybe 16. 16 15 or 16 um and you know that made sense because you know it wasn't all the time it was a normal birthday on the off years but yeah. then it, you'd have a bigger year every like five years or whatever mm-hmm. and and even then for us like a big birthday like my mom's budget was probably like 20 bucks we had no money you know when i was young but it's it felt you could tell there was a difference between yeah. the 
the big birthdays and not like you'd have a lot of friends over and things like mm-hmm. that um, if it was a big year. I but remember. I think how... that's fine to do that. Yeah. I think that is a really good uh, good schedule. I remember when I was younger, we used to have like larger parties. I, rem- I have pictures from going to Chuck E. Cheese. I don't have any memory- memories of that, but with a bunch of friends. And then once we got to a certain age, we were like, we could invite two friends over mm. for a sleepover. Um, and then our day, like we got everything we wanted to eat, our favorite dinner, yeah. our, like our favorite breakfast, um, and you know, gifts. We usually did gifts in the morning. It was really fun. So we took the kids to jump time in meridian idaho close to boise i had so much fun i think we're planning on going back this maybe this weekend or next week so it's been a really kind of festive nice couple of weeks just taking those extra days off just to you know celebrate the kids and just to have a little downtime too was They're growing really, up it's really nice i know a two-year-old and a five-year-old yeah it's crazy anyway that is it for today's recap thank you again to hoslink for sponsoring today's video and you guys have a great week we'll see you in the next one bye